Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited today to introduce to you Dr. Tina Payne Bryson. Dr. Bryson is a licensed clinical social worker. She's a graduate of Baylor University with a PhD from the University of Southern California. Uh, She's known as a keynote conference speaker. She does workshops for parents, educators, and clinicians all over the world. She's a favorite consultant in uh, areas of schools, businesses, and even some uh, very great organizations. She's the founder and executive director of the Center for Connection, which is a multidisciplinary uh, clinical practice in Southern California, and she is a New York Times best-selling author, along with her co-author, Dr. Dan Siegel, and she's written The Whole Brain Child, which is a staple gold standard book that every parent should have. She's also written No Drama Discipline, The Yes Brain, The Power of Showing Up, all of which, again, should be in the libraries of every parent. Uh, But she's also written this book called The Bottom Line for Baby. Really encourage any new parent that's just had a baby or about to have a baby to grab that uh, to answer a lot of the questions of best practices for a baby. Uh, But most importantly, she's married and has three boys, and today we welcome Tina to our program. Tina, it's so great to have you on with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. I love it. Well, first, I want to uh, wish you a happy Mother's Day. Thank you so much. My boys are now 21, 18, and 14. And, you know, it's bittersweet as they get older. You don't get as many cuddles and you don't get the kind of like brain dump where they just tell you everything. But it gets fun in really great ways, too. So it's sort of bittersweet. You know, that my boys are, you know, deep thinkers who are in ethics classes. And so dinner conversations are much more interesting than the kind of early body humor based dinner conversations when they were, you know, body humor, uh, humor when they were little. Um, we now talk about, you know, really deeper ideas. So um, they still try to mess with me, but uh, it's really fun. It's really fun when they get older, too. And, and you have a different kind of relationship with them. Yeah, sounds like they're healthy boys. I love (laughs) healthy boys that just are uh, hilarious, always coming up with something fun. Well, let's talk about your uh, your own mother's motherhood story. And uh, let's look at the backstory that even brought you to be a professional expert in the field of parenting. Kind of dig into that with us. Well, you know, that was never my intention. I never intended to be a parenting person or even an author. Um, I loved teaching when I was um, 18 and 19. I went on a mission trip um, and I discovered during that time that I knew that my life would be most meaningful if I were investing it in people. And um, so I planned on being a high school English teacher. So that's what my first degree is in, is to be, a, and I'm still certified to teach high school English in the state of Texas. Um, I live in California. Wow. And uh, I loved teaching and sharing ideas and getting people excited about ideas. And But my main goal was to be a stay-at-home mom. That was what I knew from the time I was five. I knew that was what I wanted. And so my husband and I were married six years before we had kids to let him finish his degree so that we could afford for me to do that. Um, and he uh, plans don't you know always go the way we want them to. I'm from California. I really wanted to be near my family. We moved to California with our four month old, um, our firstborn. And after my husband's an English professor, and we could not survive on his salary. So he said, you know, you've got to go to work. And I said, well, that's not the plan. And he said, well, we have to change the plan. So I said, okay, well, if I'm gonna work. I need to be a professor so that I can have a schedule where I can really be home in the summers and, you know, really be involved in our boys' lives. And um, so I said, I need to get a PhD really fast. So um, I got a PhD with uh, an 18-month-old. I started the program and had childcare between my husband and my mom and was able to um, navigate through that program. And as I started that program, a PhD in social work, I discovered the field of interpersonal neurobiology and started really understanding how 
impactful relationships are on the mind and the brain and how our relationships and the mind and the brain are all interacting to shape who we are. And we can intervene, intervene in those areas, but we can also be really intentional about those areas to, as we talk about in the whole brain child, to integrate the brain um, in the most optimal way. And so as I started learning, I said, oh my gosh, parents have to know about this. Teachers need to know about this. And so um, my plan to become a, a researcher and professor was derailed by wanting to do more in the trenches work with parents. So as I studied more, um, I said, I, you know, so I, I studied with Dan Siegel um, for 10 years in addition to my PhD. And as I was learning this stuff and sharing with him and really practicing it in parenting, you know, teaching my kids the hand model, teaching my four-year-old about flipping his lid and what was happening in his brain. Um, and so I went to Dan and I said, you know, I really want to share this with parents. We should write a book together. And so that's how that happened. <laughs> oh my gosh, which is so amazing. Uh, in all of the training I've done, Dr. Dan Siegel's work with attachment has been a game changer. So let's talk about attachment. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you are a leading expert in the whole field of understanding attachment. And I love uh, child development psychologist and psychology because it makes the uh, the principles accessible. I love hearing the language that's used and you you use it beautifully. So uh, talk to us about attachment, what it means and, uh, and, and how uh, we as kids grow up to experience relationships through this thing called attachment patterns. Yeah, so my favorite thing about attachment science is that it's full of hope um, and it is, you know, really what we find in attachment science is that over 50 years of cross-cultural research tells us that one of the best predictors for how well kids turn out on really everything we measure them on, even longitudinally, is that they have what's called secure attachment with at least one person. And before I explain what that is and what it looks like, um, I want us to be really clear that what I'm talking about is not the same thing as attachment parenting. So attachment parenting, um, you know, has become very very popular and you know there's some lovely pieces to it but I'm not talking about that you know really I'm talking about I really actually wish it weren't called that because it's really a set of behaviors you do to bond with your baby and your child and attachment is actually not at all about a checklist of behaviors it's really more about the way we are and who we are in relationship with our child so even if you do all the things that attachment parenting suggests you you know, you may not have a child that's securely attached to you. And if you don't do any of them, you could still have a child that's securely attached to you. So I, it's kind of a misnomer from my perspective. What I mean when I say attachment and what I'm talking about is under the umbrella of developmental psychology is really what happens in mammals and particularly primates is that when we are born, we are very vulnerable and we rely on our caregivers in order to even survive. So we have this instinct as mammals that when we are in danger, when we are in distress, when we are in pain, to seek proximity or closeness to our attachment figures or our caregivers. And their job is to see our need, respond to our need, you know, tuning into our needs, and then helping us feel connected and protected. So, you know, this isn't just humans. Um, when I took my dog to the groomer, uh, which she doesn't go very often, she's kind of a ragamuffin and we just are fine with that. Um, but when I took her recently, she began to tremble and, um, and pant more and cry a little bit and got closer to me. And when I, I, I noticed that she was feeling stressed, I crouched down and began to pet her and talk to her and just say, I know, I know, you know, and just talking to her. And as I talked to her and comforted her, her I began to regulate her emotions, her, her emotional experience, and I began to regulate her physiological state. What I mean by that specifically is like her heart rate slows down and the tension in her muscles relaxes. And so that's really the primary function of what attachment is, is for caregivers to notice when there's need and regulate physiological and emotional states all under the kind of assumption that our job is to protect them from harm. And so that's really what attachment is about. And we have those attachment needs throughout our whole lifespan. And the kinds of attachment experiences we have growing up, the repeated experiences we have with our caregivers, really become wired in our brain for what we expect in relationships. So if you have a caregiver that provides you with secure attachment, you have a lot, not perfect, but enough repeated experiences to say, 
I can trust that if I have a need, someone's going to see it and show up for me. If you instead grew up with one lot, there are three different patterns of insecure attachment um, and without going too much into detail unless you'd like to, um, you know, you may have a caregiver who doesn't see and respond to your emotional needs at all. And you're kind of in an emotional desert and you're on your own and you're taught that your caregivers don't respond very well when you have an emotional need. So you've really sort of learned to tune that part of yourself out. Um, or you may have a really unpredictable, chaotic caregiver who is really inconsistent in their ability to see and respond to your needs. Or worse, you have what's called disorganized attachment where instead of your caregiver being the source of your connection and protection that you go to to be safe, your caregiver is actually the source of your terror and your pain. Um, and when that happens, it actually causes disorganization in the brain because you have one circuit biologically that's wired in us to say, go to your caregiver to be safe. They've got you. And then if your caregiver is the source of your pain or terror or fear, then you have another circuit that says, get away from what's dangerous. So it's literally um, disorganizing in the brain. And when it's consistent throughout childhood, um, this pattern is actually the best predictor we have for psychopathology or mental illness in adulthood. The good news about all of that is, is no matter wow. what, and, and by the way, it's not so simple because we, most of us have multiple caregivers. So we might have a different yeah. pattern of attachment with one parent and another. Uh, we might have a different pattern of attachment with a grandparent or a pastor or a teacher, right? And ideally we have lots of adults who show up for us and provide us with secure attachment. But the research says as long as you've got one really good one, you can have a lot of the benefits of secure attachment. And what's beautiful about this too is that no matter how our brains have been wired as, um, as parents ourselves, based on our own caregiving and relational experiences, um, we always, it's never too late to make a change because these attachment patterns are based on repeated experiences. So when the experiences begin to change, when parents are, be able, are able to sort of start shifting their behaviors to be more responsive to their kids, and we can talk about the four S's if you'd like, but- Yeah, yeah. let's jump into that up, too. Okay, yeah. So when we start showing up for our kids and meeting their needs and seeing their needs, our kids' brains and their patterns that get wired in their brains can start shifting too. So that's one of my favorite things is that the number one predictor for how well we're able to provide secure attachment to our kids is not whether or not we had it, thank God, because it's about 35% of us who had a more insecure pattern of attachment, but rather whether or not we have reflected on those experiences and made sense of them. So instead of running from our past and saying, oh, it's just the past, it doesn't matter, or instead of getting flooded and entangled in our past all the time where it's intruding on our lives, we wanna say, and, and actually people who get earned secure attachment, meaning you didn't have it, but you have done your work and you have earned it. Mm. Um, it's actually called free and autonomous attachment in adulthood. And what that means is we wow. are free to reflect on our history and reflect on our, make, our relationships, make sense of them, so we can be autonomous and not, and not ensnared by our previous patterns. Hey everybody, I wanna slide right in here and thank you for joining us for today's episode. Let me ask you for a huge favor. If this podcast is providing value to you, would you consider subscribing to it wherever you get your podcasts? Also, if you feel that it would be valuable to somebody else, please like it, comment on it, and share it on your social media feeds like YouTube, Facebook, or wherever you populate networking. And one more big, big favor. If you like the show, please go review it. And if it's true for you, give us five stars. And when you review it and rate it, it gives our efforts greater opportunity to grow, and that would mean the world to us. Now let's go back to this week's episode. When we are trying to provide secure attachment to our kids, number one is make sense of your own story, right? Do your own reflection. Yeah. And that's an ongoing lifelong experience, mm -hmm. right? But the right. other thing is, what do we do in the moments? What do we, how do we promote secure attachment? If it's the most important thing we can do to cultivate optimal development, how do we do it? And so Dan and I always like to use acronyms and simple things to remember. And so we talked about the four S's in our book, The Power of Showing Up. And that's really about um, safe is the first one. And that's of course, keeping our children protected from harm. And most of us are pretty good at that. But it's also making the repair with our children 
when we as parents either are fighting with our spouse in really reactive ways that might be frightening to our child, or even wrote, even it's not directed at your child or your, your significant other, you're driving and you have a road rage incident. Or anytime we become really reactive as parents, maybe sometimes it's even directed at our children. We scream and yell, we act immature, um, you know, we do these kinds of things. Those are moments we become unpredictable as parents and we are reactive. And you can imagine if your life depends on this caregiver to keep you connected and protected, if they're out of control, they cannot do that. And unpredictability is, um, it's dangerous when our, in the way our brains predict. So our brains are like, okay, what's predictable makes me feel safe. What's not predictable makes me feel not safe. So the key is we don't have to be perfect as parents, but when we violate that sense of my parent is gonna keep me safe and they're in control of the world and I can count on them, we just make the repair. We go to them yeah. and say, oh, I really wish I had handled that differently. I got really angry and I should have walked away and taken a breath and calmed myself down. I'm so sorry that I handled it that way. Will you forgive me? Or can I have a do over, right? So we really just go and make the repair. And the research shows, and this is another great hopeful message from attachment, is that even if we're unpredictable in the moment, if we consistently repair with our kids after those ruptures, their brain is like, oh, this doesn't feel very good. Mom's angry right now. And, and I don't like this. And this is messy and uncomfortable. And I know she's going to come make it right. So there's a sense of predictability even in that. And it actually widens our children's window of tolerance or their resilience wow. relationally. So yeah. that's a big yeah. key of, of safe. Well, I want to jump in there with you on that. One of the things that you shared in our group that you're leading some of us to dig into ideas is that even when you and your spouse kind of have a fight that uh, the kids hear, uh, you repair with the spouse, but the kids left out there not necessarily being invited into that repair. And even that can have a residue for them of what does this mean for who I am? Is life okay? And what you use the word predictable. Is yeah. it predictable? I, I think that's amazing. So that's safe. And then uh, what are the other three? The second one is seen, and seen is about tuning into the mind behind the behavior. This is really about tuning into what our child's internal experience is in that moment. So this one can be really hard to do, Patrick, because we as a society are so focused on behavior. So let's say mm, your kid, right. um, let's say, like, I love to tell this story about a time I offered to take my kid to the movies after school. I said, I'm going to pick you up and we're going to go to the movies today. He was probably eight or so at the time. And um, he was really excited and I was you know, so happy to see his anticipation. And then he said, can we get popcorn too? And I said, no, we're not gonna get popcorn today. We've been having a lot of junk food. I'll bring a healthy snack. And he began to pout. Now my first instinct in that moment is actually based in fear. So my fear response is, oh no, I have a spoiled child who thinks the world revolves around him. He has no perspective of the suffering in the world. He's indulged. And then, you know, th that like looming fear, eventually it can really take us to ridiculous places as parents. And we're not even aware that that's what's happening, right? Eventually we're like, oh my gosh, he's gonna live in a van down by the river and never amount to anything because he's pouting about popcorn, right? But what scene does is, and, and this is also layered in from no drama discipline, which is the idea that Discipline, the point and purpose of it is to raise children who are self-disciplined, right? Who do the right thing when no one's watching. And that requires a ton of teaching and skill building and waiting for the brain to develop over time. So in that moment, I go, okay, behavior is communication. He's telling me, hey, mom, I need some gratitude practice. Hey, mom, I need some perspective. Hey, mom, I need some Amazing. practice dealing with disappointment when things don't go my way. So I make mental note, okay, at dinner time, how am I gonna build those skills? Dinner time, we're gonna start with a gratitude practice and we're gonna start, you know, and I also know he's gonna get better at dealing with disappointments when he, you know, in six months when his brain's more developed, etc. But in that moment, instead of focusing on behavior and my own fear response, I'm gonna tune in to what is his internal experience and I'm gonna respond in a way that's a match. So I'm gonna say, hey, when I said movies, you got really excited, but when I said no popcorn, you looked really disappointed. Is that what happened there or what, what was going on for you? And he said, yeah, last time we went to the movies, you got me popcorn and I love movie popcorn and I don't get it very often. So when you said no, I just felt disappointed. 
And I say, yeah, sometimes it can be disappointing when things don't go the way we, we want them to and when we don't get things, you know, the way we hope. And then I say, would you still like to go to the movies? Now notice, I'm holding my boundary of no popcorn. I, this is not right. indulgent. It's not giving, it's not, I'm saying yes to my child's internal experience, even if I'm saying no to the behavior. So this is not mm -hmm. about permissiveness. Boundaries and limits help our kids actually feel safe. So I'm holding my boundary, but I'm also giving him permission to feel what he feels and to share it with me. Now, mm -hmm. what can happen instead is if I'm critical, if I say, I can't believe you're pouting about that. Seriously, like you're even lucky you even get to go to the movies. And if I become critical in response, then his brain, which is an association machine, says that didn't feel good to share what I, what I was really thinking and what I was really feeling when I shared it with her. That didn't feel very good. So maybe I won't do that next time. Or even more explicitly, I, you know, our kids melting down and they're pouting about something or they're angry about something. And we say, I don't want to hear it. They internalize that and over time we will stop hearing it. So what I, you know, and, and we do such silly things in violation of this scene thing too, like our kids upset about something and we go, why are you so upset about that? It's not that big of a deal. As if ever a kid would say, oh, that's really helpful. I'm not very upset anymore. <laughs> no, they just learn to say, okay, she doesn't want to hear it, which means I'm not mm. going to share other things with her and I'm alone in it. There's no one who's yeah. going to show up and walk me through this. So that's scene. The third one is soothed and soothing is what it sounds like. It's nurture, it's comfort, it's help, it's support. And I wanna kind of challenge everyone that's listening to think about when our children are physically hurt, it's really easy to tune into that soothing response, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We don't, it's not their fault typically, or even if it is, we, they're suffering and so we show up for them and we comfort and we say, you know, I'm right here, how can I help? How can I make you more comfortable? Um, it'll feel better soon. Like we just really show up in those moments. The part of the brain that lights up and gets active during physical pain is also the same part of the brain that gets active and lights up in emotional pain. And so when kids are in emotional pain, which sometimes looks like disrespectful back talk, which sometimes looks like meltdowns and tantrums, you know, it's not always pleasant behavior. You know, it'd be so much easier if our kids came to us when they're crying, it's easier to get into this. But when it comes out as acting out behavior, it'd be so much easier to access that as parents if our kids were like, hey, I'm feeling um, a lot of resentment towards my sibling right now because I feel like there are some unfair practices and I have a lot of big feelings about that. That's typically not how they come to us. They typically <laughs> come to us after hitting their sibling and screaming at their sibling and slamming a door and yelling at us, right? Um, but yeah. in that moment, if we can go, okay, my child is in distress emotionally, I guess I'm gonna address all the behavior, but again, yeah. from no drama discipline, if we're going to be effective disciplinarians, and by that I mean teachers, our kids' brains have to be in a receptive, open state in which to learn. And when they're mm. reactive and acting out, they absolutely cannot learn. So that's the worst yeah. time to actually discipline or do that teaching and scale building. So in the name of discipline, the first thing I'm going to do is help my kid get regulated and calm so they can listen to that message and be held accountable. So in that moment, um, what I really need to do is to help my child move back to regulation. So the quickest way to do that is through empathy and connection. So oh. even if my kid is falling apart, you know, so I'll give another story. Um, same kid, um, about age 10, has to go to sleep, um, but his older brothers are staying up later and that's upsetting to him. And so as I begin to try to read him stories, he's flopping like a fish out of water because he's so angry. His body's just, uh, you know, he's growling like an animal. And, and what I want to do in that moment is throw out a threat and to say, right. you know what, if you're going to do this, I'm not reading stories to you. Um, yeah. And the problem with that is, number one, that doesn't teach any skills. Number two, it makes him more dysregulated. So it's gonna be harder to go to sleep and harder for me to teach the lesson. Let me jump in again and tell you about two amazing opportunities for pastors, spouses, and senior leaders of ministry that will increase your leadership. And they're both free. I'm talking about monthly Zooms and also weekly process groups. First, we hold a monthly Zoom event that is one plus hours with Dr. Todd Bowman, a psychologist and human behavior expert, and me. We usually have around 15 to 30 other participating pastors, spouses, and leaders. 
The monthlies have been amazing to help pastors collaborate around tactics, personnel challenges, and even how to navigate our own inner world. The skills you'll learn and a newfound pastoral community will expand your leadership mapping with everybody you lead. These monthly Zooms happen every month on the second Mondays at 6 p.m. Central Time. And then the second opportunity for pastors and spouses is our weekly process group that spans for six weeks. In our weekly process group, we provide tools that guide you into your story and help you rediscover you, redefine leadership, redeem life, and redream ministry. Weekly process groups give time to open your stories as you collect the dots, connect the dots, and correct the dots. Attunement begins with you making sense of your story. When you live with mindful attunement to your story, you'll find that the people you lead will begin to also make leadership sense to you in profound new ways. Our alumni tell us that this is one of the most impactful experiences they have ever had. We place ladies in groups of six to 10, and also we put men in groups of six to 10. The value of the weekly experience is 900 plus dollars per person. However, in this season, we're offering it to you for free. You can see some of our alumni sharing stories on our events web pages. You can find out everything you need to know to get involved in either the monthlies or the weekly process groups by going to redinkrevival.com. I hope to see you there soon. So typically before I learned all of this, I would spend a ton of, and you've heard me talk about this before, Patrick, a ton of emotional and mental um, attention and energy trying to figure out how do I fix this? What do I do? How do I get this mm. to stop? You know, and, and I go to all those worry places. But what I've learned in this attachment science is that I don't have to do any of that. My job is to provide the four nice. S's. And I know I'm just in the third one right now. So what I say to my kid is, oh, you feel, you're so angry right now. So I'm really just matching, you know, I'm trying to connect with what he's feeling and naming it. And that's also really helpful too, to name the feelings. Um, and we know from the whole brain child and the research in there that when we accurately name an emotion, it actually helps downregulate the reactivity in the brain as well. So I say, you, you know, you're really, really angry right now. And when things feel unfair, that can be really upsetting, can't it? And he's like, ugh. And I say, I'm, I'm right here with you as you're feeling upset. Mm, beautiful. I don't do anything. I don't distract him. I don't fix anything. I don't offer, you know, bribes or anything like that. What I'm doing is sitting with him. And that's a big part of soothing is just being present with empathy um, and mm. holding space. You know, um, I talked to a chaplain one time that said the most important thing she does when she walks into a hospital room or hospice is sit down. And I said, why is that the most important thing? And she said, when I sit down, it communicates to the person, you're important to me, I have time for you. And so I've really, I've, that's actually made a huge difference in my, in my marriage too. I'm a very hummingbird-like person doing a million things at once and I'm a go, go, yeah. go. And sometimes my family needs my attention. And so yeah. just sitting down and closing my devices. So, but back to that scenario with my kid who's raging, you know, I say that and I say, I'm right here with you. And when I do that, I'm giving him some additional messaging. I'm saying, I can handle your big feelings. You don't have to protect me. I've got you, right? Which is really what attachment's all about. And I'm communicating to him, I trust that you can handle your big feelings and you're gonna make it through this. Mm. And that's what builds resilience. Amazing. The way we become resilient yeah. is by practicing walking through difficult things with enough support. So that's that really soothing. Amazing. Yeah. And well, what's amazing is all of these aren't just limited to parenting with kids. I think of it as pastors with congregations. I think of it in organizational leadership. I think of it in marriage. I think of it in friendship. Uh, this is honestly game changer type stuff. It's and, and you know, and so I'll get to the four S and then and then the fourth yeah. S and then I'll yeah. I'll say what you're saying right now, right now, which is you know, there are so many moments as a wife, daughter, best friend, mom, clinician, mental health therapist, um, child development specialist in a school where I don't know what the exact right answer is. I'm not sure what the yeah. next step is. I don't know what to say or to do. But here's what I love about the four S's is they are my North Star because it's mm. always the right answer. 
And yeah. if I can help the person feel safe, seen, soothed, and secure, I know that that is going to be number one effective in helping them get back to a more integrated, back to themselves, back to their ability to use their prefrontal cortex to um, have insight and sound decision making and regulate their emotions and all of those things. But it's also building the brain. So that's one of the things we know is that people who have secure attachment relationships have the abilities and capacities that the prefrontal cortex provides. So it's actually brain building too. So I love that as a clinician um, and or you know as a pastor to say, just showing up that simple thing mm. is everything. It's 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 really freeing to, to do that. So that leads us to the fourth S, which is secure. And I don't mean like self-esteem, like I feel secure about myself. That is for sure an outcome of having secure attachment. But what it means is that our brains have been wired based on these not perfect. Again, we can mess up all the time, uh, as long as we make the, the repair after the rupture, um, that, that when kids have enough experiences or spouses or you know, a congregation or whatever application we're using, when our kids have enough repeated experiences of feeling safe, seen, and soothed, they develop this fourth S. And what I mean by that, secure, is that their brains have been wired to know and to expect that if they have a need, someone's gonna see it and show up for them. And so, as you might expect, that plays out in having healthier friendships and healthier romantic relationships down the road and sets them up to be parents who can provide secure attachment. And one other huge outcome yeah. of that is that kids then learn how to show up for themselves. They learn how to see, uh, to keep themselves safe. They learn how to see and understand themselves. So they have that reflective mm, ability beautiful. to create that coherent narratives to make sense of their own story. Yeah. They learn to soothe themselves. And I think one of the big pushbacks I get from parents is they're like, you mean when your kid's having really bad behavior and they're acting crazy and really dysregulated, you're gonna comfort them? What are you talking about? Doesn't that make them spoiled and indulged? And what I say to that is actually twofold. One is being empathetic and connected and soothing is not the opposite of having limits and boundaries. We actually need high of both. They're not opposite, yeah. they're not on one spectrum. They're two separate spectrums. So we can still hold boundaries and limits. That's where our, we get into trouble, but we wanna yeah. be really warm and responsive and show empathy. But the other thing is, the brain develops what it gets practiced doing. So just like when I lift weights and I do reps, repetitions, yeah. I build that muscle, that's how the prefrontal cortex in particular works. So when kids get practice falling apart, being dysregulated, and we show up and comfort and regulate them or do what we call co-regulate, it actually gives their brain a rep of moving from a dysregulated state back into a regulated state. So they learn how to do it for themselves. So they learn then how to soothe themselves. And then they also um, can provide that security in all of their other relationships. So that's really what the four S's are all about. And like I said, they are really the North Star. How would you like to reboot your personal finances this year? How would you like to take control of your money, turning small wins into big results? I want to encourage you to check out my wife, Tina's financial coaching business at tinanorris.org. You might be wondering, what is a financial coach? A coach is someone who will personally team up with you to outline financial goals, inspire you with energy, help you stay focused on your goals, and so much more. You can do it all through Zoom, and she provides a free initial consultation, so there's no pain or cost to you for your first steps. Maybe you've been to several Financial Peace University cycles, left with great intentions, but struggled to execute. You need a trainer, a coach, another human that won't shame or judge you to help you stay on track. Tina is a certified expert that will help you with clarifying financial dreams, understanding spending patterns, reviewing all financial obligations, assessing financial and insurance needs, defining a spending plan, understanding your emotional profile related to money, building margin for savings and emergency funds, learning strategies for attacking debt, and referring recommended financial advisors to multiply your tomorrow. And she isn't selling any products, policies, or investments. She is the ultimate financial teammate. 
As Tina's husband of 30 years, I can tell you firsthand how much of a difference Tina's skills and giftings have made. Our financial portfolio wouldn't be a fraction of what it is today if it wasn't for her. She works with clients that are single parents, everyday people, pastors and church staff, as well as high income professionals. I've known executives of Fortune 500 companies that manage billion dollar budgets at work, but then come home to complete financial disorder and disappointments. Shame roars at them as they face the stresses of marriage, kids, and struggling retirement plans. A personal trainer can change the way you think, emote, and behave. If you have friends, church members, clients, or even young marrieds that are launching their financial lives, you will do them all a favor to have them check out this amazing option. If professional athletes need a coach to win the day to fulfill their dreams, then you and I do too. And you won't find anybody better to help you get there than Tina Norris. Set up your free consultation from anywhere in the world today. Go to tinanorris.org to find out all the details. And in all of your content, in all of your books, uh, I wish that my wife and I had have had that back when we were raising our boys. Our boys now are 26 and 23. Both of them are in ministry and they are uh, they're amazing to us. <laughs> but we were very uh, behavior oriented. We focused on, you know, making sure the right attitudes were there. And if it wasn't, we were going to force it. And, you yeah. know, I'm not going to I'm not going to over exaggerate that in the sense that we did show up. We were soothing and nurturing in some yep. ways. But if I had it to do what's that? And that's what matters. And if I had it to do over, that's the lion's share. That's yeah. where I would have put my emphasis. Yeah. And I think about that, and I at times have had kind of guilt and shame. And for you, you are somebody telling these stories. And I know, I know that you are a transparent mama, uh, yep. not only a professional, but you're <laughs> you're not projecting something that's untrue of you. So you're not like sterilized you actually have had moments yourself that you've had regrets and oh, yeah. i would love for you to you know help some of our moms on this mother's day help us all process through moments what do you do uh have you had anxious times where you thought man am i screwing my kid up <laughs> and then how did you deal with it Yes, all the time. Um, I'll say one book that really helped me is Dr. Michael Thompson's book, It's a Boy. That was sort of my Bible um, in all my boys growing up years because I would be like, this is not going well. And then I would read his chapter and on, or on that age that my boys were, and he would constantly remind me to trust development. So that was a huge assurance to me. Mm, but yes, and amazing. you know, Patrick, you've heard me tell my stories about threatening to remove my three-year-old, a, a, a body part on my three-year-old. I said, if you stick your tongue out one more time, I'm going to rip it out. And times I threw the dice across the room when we were playing Yahtzee, now referred to as the Yahtzee incident. And yeah, and times I'm immature and times I, um, I get, I, I kind of freak out and overreact and then my kids are like okay I can't tell you things so yes I have I've had all of those moments but here's what I would say about this I think that assuming you're a loving parent and you're not abusive we should have a lot of regret moments I mm, feel like wow. yeah at first of all we know from the science that when we make when we have the ruptures and we make the repairs it is more uh resilience building relationally for our kids so the first time their friend gets mad at them they don't think the relationship's over okay so that's huge we teach them to repair we you know by modeling it and that's one of the best way kids ways kids learn is by modeling it um and and the, but the other piece is this um if i got out my middle school diary and i read it and i thought it was really insightful and brilliant. What would that say about how much development I've had from age 13 until now 49? It would show that I had pretty arrested development, right? I look back on that diary and I'm mortified. And so I think that when we have moments when we look back and go, you know what, I wish I had known this different uh, earlier. I wish I had done this differently. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I talked to my child in that way. I would never let anyone talk to my child in that way. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. When we have those feelings, what that means to me is that we are people who are reflecting, which is mm. such a 
huge part of that making sense of our own wow. story. It means we are evolving and learning and growing and changing. So if you don't have any of those kind of feelings, it probably means you're not being intentional and you're not reflecting because none of us are perfect. So to me, the fact that we feel that feeling is actually a gift and it's a moment of gratitude to say, yeah, I, I wish I had known better, but that means I mo know more now. And then the other piece of it, That's Patrick, amazing. is that when we have those moments and we, you still probably do from time to time, miss a tune with your adult guys and you, you know, or yeah. whatever. And when we have those moments as parents that we don't feel good about how we've parented, whether it's in the past or just has happened just in the moment, it's actually an invitation. If we let ourselves go down the shame spiral route and say, beat mm. ourselves up, that actually makes us vulnerable to continuing to flip our lids more. But instead, if we go, okay, I just messed up, or I'm thinking about that time I did that thing to my kid, or I said that thing, and I'm still thinking about it. Those moments are an invitation to ask ourselves, what was the meaning of that for me? What got in the way of me being the parent I wanted to be? And sometimes when I ask myself that question, I would go, I haven't peed by myself in four years and I'm exhausted, <laughs> and starving, and I haven't had an adult conversation uh -huh. and I'm grumpy and that's why that happened. But then other times we can say, you know what? I'm not taking care of myself or mm. whenever my kid rejects me, that activates something in me that I'm not sure what that's about, but I need mm. to shine the light of awareness on that and do some soul searching about that and pray about that or do some journaling about that or talk to a therapist about it because those reflective moments allow us to start really tuning into ourselves. And the truth is we get much better at tuning into our children's needs and attuning to them if we do it with ourselves. So it really, it's important Beautiful. that we do that for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting. You said uh, in previous times that even the most securely attached parent or parenting patterns to the child will get it wrong 50% of the time. Is, it's actually more is, than that. It's, we have even more leeway than that. And that's based on Ed Tronic's beautiful work with um, typically mother and, and baby, sometimes father, but tip, most of the research has been done on moms and babies, although that's changing, which is great. But really he says that the parents that are the most attuned to their children, who really are tuned into their child's needs and adjust to it and all of that, only are able to do it about 70% of the time. So that, gets, I'm sorry, only about 30% of the time, which means we've got about 70% of leeway to not get it right all the time, right? Um, and yeah, sometimes, absolutely. Those are, sometimes those are minor breaches, like a time I'm giving my kid a hard time about something and we're joking and then all of a sudden it doesn't feel fun to my kid and it hurts their feelings. You know, that's a micro moment where I go, oh, I'm sorry, sweetie, I thought we were having fun, but the way I said that didn't feel good. Is that right? And I, and you know, so we can make those micro attunements. And then other times it's bigger things like, you know, I, I'm really um, encouraging parents, like you just mentioned a minute ago, to not, to move from a lens of focusing on compliance and focus yeah. more on regulation. So if you are focused mm. on your child being regulated, compliance happens. Like if your kid is regulated and you ask them to do something, they're going to typically do it. They might grumble, but they're going to do it. It's it, But if we are forcing obedience and compliance, our kids might be really dysregulated as they do it. So, and I could tell lots of stories about that, but compliance is, um, you know, really not the goal. It's really about skill building and being regulated and, and kids will do the right thing typically anyway. So as I'm, as I'm helping the parents shift, you know, shift into that lens, you know, I think they're having these moments of like, oh, I wish I had known that or those kinds of things. But I think it's just so important that we free ourselves from that, that harsh voice that we have inside of ourselves and know that um, we're, you know, we're making steps in the right direction. And as long as we are what Winnicott called a good enough parent, that is really providing our kids with so many benefits. So, and the other thing is it's never too late. It's never too late to make that repair. And those of you who are listening who have adult children, you can even have conversations with them and say, you know what, I've been thinking about some of this stuff. I wish I had done this differently. And it can be such yes. a beautiful beginning of healing in your relationship. 
Hey, I want to invite you, if you are listening and thinking, I have so many questions I would like to ask. We would love to address your questions on an upcoming episode. In fact, we may do an entire episode on the one question that you have. If you will simply email us at redinkrevival at gmail.com, we will catalog all of these questions and we would love to be able to address the things on your heart and on your mind. So be sure to get in touch with us and we'll take the journey together. One of the things that I'm thinking of as you go through this is I love to take ideas and transpose them across different topics. And as a pastor, I think of how often people size God up as purely being a behaviorist God. And of course, uh, Baylor University did a study uh, around folks who thought of God as being authoritarian, critical, or distant, and what that did to the brain. Uh, And I think about how Jesus comes along and he undoes this idea of behaviorism, says really it's about the heart. It's about the deeper uh, things that are happening within the heart and soul of an individual. And I, I love the ideas of what you're talking about in parenting as we begin to reconstruct how we think about God's love and mercy and grace in our lives and that he actually has more empathy for our spin outs and our patterns that are painful and destructive. He cares so much deeper about where that's coming from than he cares about the behavior itself. And that's just that's a side a- note, but you help me with that. That's the message of the gospel, isn't it? Right. You know, and and really the idea of, you know, and I think, you know, a lot of Jesus's messages were around, you know, skill building. Like, what are you going to do differently now? Right. And like, how are we going to, you know, go and sin no more. Right. So that idea of really thinking about and that reflective piece of saying, hey, what was that about for me? You know, that's such an important part of our, our journeys. And the other thing that's really interesting is there's been quite a bit of research on God as an attachment figure. And so we can mm-hmm. do this almost in concentric circles, right? If if God is someone who helps you and for, cer- for certain has for me for many, many years, helped me feel safe and seen and soothed mm. and secure, right? I mean, that's really what it is. And then that allows us to pro- to show up um, in that way in our in our romantic relationships yes. with parents. So it really is. I and as the pastor, that. that's what you're doing for your congregation. And then your congregation can go and do that. You know, I even teach the four S's to 20 year olds who are camp counselors um, at sleepaway camps in the summer. And, you know, and I say to the directors, the camp directors and the camp leadership, you've got to do the four S's for your counselors or the counselors can't do it for the, the campers, you know. And I think that's one other piece too, Patrick, is that I say this is a North Star and it's actually really simple, right? I say, even in the moment, you don't have to figure out what to do. Just show up, be present. That's not Mm. always easy to do, even though it's a simple idea. And I think a big (laughs) piece of this is making sure that we are showing up for ourselves and that we have other people Mm. who show up for us so that we have the capacity to do it. Because if we don't have the capacity to do it, even if we know it, it's going to be impossible. One other thing, and that is that, you know, the brain, like I said, gets to practice what it gets develops what it gets practiced doing. And so the more we practice this kind of parenting, the easier it gets because your brain starts to wire and you start to see not only does it work, it's much more effective than command and demand, um, especially in terms of the long term stuff. But it's also it feels right. You know, it feels right to be in relationship with our children in that way. Um, and mm. to be their comforters and to be their soothers. It's such a, a powerful thing that I think is rewarding for us, which makes us want to keep doing it as well. Yes, yes, I 100% agree. Well, let's uh, go to the deep end of the pool on the, the mom guilt. Um, I notice how often, not just moms, but parents together will exaggerate or build imaginary guilt uh, around things that have happened with their kids. And it may not be objective. It's just that they're having these emotional happenings. Uh, Can you encourage and speak to moms in particular who struggle with the guilt that they they didn't provide the kind of tools for their kids that they needed to. And so some of the kids today are adults and they fail to launch or they deal with addiction or they're struggling in other areas of their lives. 
and moms can personalize every small difficulty in their kids as being something that they should own rather than the kid taking responsibility for their own transformation and yeah. growth. Can you talk to that? Yeah, I mean, we could spend a whole hour just on that, but a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is to know that we put so much pressure on ourselves to be everything and to do everything for our children. And actually that is not healthy for our children. You know, it's called helicopter parenting or snowplow parenting. Um, I think it's even more intense than that. I, I like to think of it more as like curling parenting where you're sweeping the ice so your child has no little bumps along the way, right? You know, this, is, this, this hyper parenting is now thought in a recent research study thought of to be the ideal way to parent and nothing could be further from the truth. So I want to just assure all of you parents that number one, it is not all on you and it should not be. So for mm. one, um, about half of who your kid turns out to be is genetics. Half of it is totally out of your control, totally wow. out of your control. Okay. And that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it is, it's about 50% experience. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, 50% genetics and about 50% experience and epigenetics. And epigenetics is really the idea of what experiences you have that impact which genes and are expressed and how they're expressed, right? So half of what happens with your kid in general is you had nothing to do with, okay? So that's a huge light shoulder off. And it's not all on us. Your child had a lot of social experiences that were outside of your parenting. Your child had a lot of educational experiences and all kinds of things. And so it is not all on us and especially not all on us as moms, right? Other caregivers, other friends, community, genetics. There are so many things at play there. The other thing is, so in a way it's, it's, it's a little bit of like, we can be like, you know what? I'm not gonna have so much hubris there. Like I thought I could take credit for all the good and all the bad, but that's just <laughs> not true. We can let yeah. go, you know, so some of the good we need to give credit to other people for as well. The other thing is that, you know, as parents, we can um, get really stuck in a lot of anxiety. And so sometimes parents who ruminate on the errors that they, um, have or that even they imagine they're blaming themselves for stuff some of that is really coming from a place of anxiety and so I think things that we can you know people don't often think about that as part of like an anxiety um, you know profile but it can be getting stuck like that in ruminating in those thoughts um, and and really fears about where I, I think a lot of it too is that we, we really should trust development a little bit more. And so even if your kid is in their, you know, if, like my, my son's, um, tw my oldest is 21. I'm counting on more brain development to unfold in the next six to seven years. I'm hoping so, right? Um, but I think that, you know, what can happen is we get really fearful about the future. And mm -hmm. then as yeah. one of the ways we try to navigate that is by trying to make sense of it as, as humans, we are meaning makers and we're always trying to construct the meaning of, of things. And so we're storytellers. And some of that is that we make up stories in our heads and in order to navigate and try to feel like we have a little bit more sense of control about a fearful future is that we try to say, oh, that happened because I did this or I wasn't this. And really those things might not be connected at all. And it goes back to the idea of being present and showing up for ourselves and soothing ourselves in those moments. Um, and really finding ways to help regulate our own worries, fears, and anxieties. And there are lots yeah. of different ways to do that. Um, and that's a whole other conversation. But I think um, letting go of some of that and noticing that some of the, the guilt and, and places of blame are actually rooted in fear and worry about the future just as much as they are about regretting the past. Yes, absolutely. And I, uh, I know that you love Dr. Dr. Andrew Huberman's work at Stanford. I yeah. And I love how he talks about the different circuits. And again, circuits in brain science sometimes can be a little generalized, but he talks about the circuits and he talks about that if you are ever put into a position where you are thinking victim, victimization, that neurochemicals will help support you to stay there. Yep. Uh, but as soon as you begin to think, okay, this is where we are, and you build 
cognitive directions on what I can do. It doesn't even have to be a great strategy, but if you at least create a strategy, your brain will release the neuro neurochemicals to help you move forward out yeah. of that victimization circuit into an empowerment type circuit. Let me break in one more time and tell you about ReadingRevival.com. R-E-D-I-N-K Revival.com. I want to encourage you to sign up for our blog e-newsletter there, as every month it will hit your inbox with a provocative blog post with topics about theology, biblical architecture for emotions, and how understanding the human brain is so helpful in giving more insights to various biblical texts. We also will feature updates on our monthly events to help you keep up on the ready for everything that is available to you. Also, I'd like to remind you if this podcast is serving you with valuable insights to subscribe to the podcast. If you think someone else would benefit from it, please review it, comment, and share it on your social media platforms. If your friends are privileged to know what's helping you, who knows what God might do in their life with the same resources. That would be a gift to us and it would be a gift to all your friends. We're holding you in our hearts and believing God with you for a year of supernatural increase. Uh, one of the questions, we've had several that came in prior to us getting on today, uh, but one of them was, what if I didn't you know, raise my kids in church? And today, because of all the struggles that they're having, uh, you know, I, I raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart, but I didn't do that. Um, I think I would answer that question by simply saying, uh, this is the reality of the human race. It's part of living in a fallen world. We don't get everything right all the time. But if we stay in that victimization circuit, if we stay in that space of I can't do anything and I live in the regret, we're going to find ourselves just recycling it again. But if what we do is say, well, what can I do with what I got? How can I make a better future with what I have? that the God, grace of God and of course the Holy Spirit will come along and, and help that. Is there anything you would add to that? I love what you just said. And I think part of it is trusting our children, regardless of their age and their own journey. Again, you know, it really is their journey and their path. And as uh, one thing in our culture is we become really enmeshed with our kids and we feel like their successes or their failures are ours and they are their own people, right? And so that's one piece of it. And I think, you know, I love Huberman's work, as you know, um, you know, the brain loves the path of least resistance. So if mm. we have, you know, if we, if we go to victim mentality, blame mentality, fear mentality, that's the path our brain's gonna keep going down unless we make a change. And the first part of it is, this is a Dan Siegel phrase, shining the light of awareness on it so that we begin to have a choice. Without awareness, mm. you don't have a choice. Your brain will just keep going wow. through the same loops. So we start by shining the light of awareness on it. Then one of the things we know from the trauma literature is that one of the, one of the ways that we can get really stuck is by going into immobilized states. So what we want to do is mobilize, like you said, pick a strategy, find, you know, taking a step to do something. Um, and yeah. those can be top down strategies. And what I mean by that are things that we would use the top part of our brain for, like a mantra that we would say or a mindfulness practice or a contemplative prayer or um, journaling or something like that that requires insight and, you know, cognitive processing. Um, the other thing we can do, which a lot of the therapy world is just now catching up on, but is still really behind on, is more bottom up strategies. And what I mean by bottom up is our sensory system, our body, and the lower structures of our brain. So for instance, Andrew Huberman talks about what he calls the, um, the physiological sigh, which is when our nervous system is really revved up and we're feeling really stressed. If we take an inhale that's shorter than our exhale. So when we have a longer exhale, so if you inhale like count of four and exhale for a count of seven or eight, that actually down regulates the reactivity of our nervous system. It's a great strategy to use to keep you from yelling at your kids or your spouse or something like that. It helps, really helps. And for me, it helps, especially if I put a hand on my chest or a hand on my belly uh, when, I, when I practice that breath. Um, but really finding ways to say, so here's, it's a kind of, I'll try to tell it as a quick story, but I was working, I was the therapist of a, a nine or 10 year old little girl who was having panic attacks. And 
I taught her both top down and bottom up strategies. So she had this day where she had forgotten her lunch money and she started to just get really, really activated where she was about to have a panic attack, but she stopped herself because we had been practicing. Um, she would argue with the worry bully. Um, so she would say, you know, it's not that big of a deal that I forgot my lunch. I'll just borrow money from my friend and buy a lunch today. So she was using these top down cognitive strategies. And then she used these, these deeper breaths with a, her hand on her chest and belly that we had been practicing together. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, I relaxed and had a good day. And so what I did was I drew um, a, a picture of a mountain and I'm a terrible drawer, but she got the point. I drew a picture of a mountain and I said, this is your worry mountain. And in the past, you've always climbed, the, something has happened and you, it made you climb the worry mountain. And you were always at the top of the worry mountain and there was a sled there and one path and you got on that sled and you went down the worry mountain and you landed in panic attack land. But today, you climbed the worry mountain, but you picked up your sled and you used your, your thoughts and your breathing and you went to a place on the hill, that, on the slope that did not have a path and you set your sled down and you went down a brand new path and you landed in a totally different place, which was relax and have a good day. That was her word, so we used that. <laughs> and I said, what's amazing about this is that every time you get to the top of the mountain, your brain's gonna wanna send you back down to panic attack land because that's the path that's the biggest path but if you keep using your tools and you keep walking mm. a new place in the mountain the snow will keep falling and it will cover up the old path and what will be left is only the new path and that's actually how you explain neuroplasticity to a nine or ten year old so i think this is what happens yeah. is we get stuck in these loops of shame and blame and fear and anxiety and beating ourselves up but if we just find one or two, we notice it. And then we go, oh, that's what I'm doing there. And then we can start finding a couple of different strategies. And again, breathing is one of them, using some mantras or a, a Bible verse that can be helpful. I love yeah. Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion. Um, she's at UT Austin. Um, Sylvia Borstein has this beautiful um, sort of thing that she does that got me through a, a period of terrible grief right after my dad died and she says really to just put a hand on your on your chest and to take a deep breath and then just say to yourself sweetheart you are in pain first mm. let's take a breath and then we'll decide what to do and just that oh, idea wow. of really connecting with yourself and and being that kind gentle providing that soothing to yourself um, and really connecting with that vulnerable part of you that's feeling reactive um, or feeling just this grief over what has happened that you wish you yeah. had done differently is to really yeah. connect with that grief, shine the light of awareness on it, be kind to ourselves, use two or three strategies to mobilize and practice them. And you actually change your brain when you do that. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I, I had some questions that came in around uh, if, I did such and such as a mom. Uh, how do I forgive myself? It, it's interesting because I'm not really sure that the word forgive is best applied to yourself because even Jesus said that it's about loving yourself, yeah. that it's about seeing yourself in flaws and imperfection and being able to have empathy to you, yourself, yeah. to be able to have radical acceptance of yourself. And when we do that in our brains, we know that it releases the neurochemicals from the anterior cingulate gyrus that then calms the amygdala that then goes into the nucleus accumbens and creates this reward for us that life is, is really good. And I, I love how you're using some of these, you know, bottom up strategies. And I know for me, when I first heard about, you know, breathing techniques or putting your hand on your, your chest, it felt like it was a little ooey gooey for me. Oh, it's just yeah. psycho babble too, kind of I was stuff. Like, no, give me the science. And then yes. turns out there's a lot of science backing up all the A lot of here. science. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it a, it's amazing. It works. Well, I, uh, I think it's not necessarily just forgiving ourselves. It's also releasing it and letting it go. And, you know, there are all kinds of, you know, our brains actually respond really well, not only to storytelling, but to rituals and to symbols. Mm. And so, you know, sometimes it might be helpful even to just write down the things you regret the most and safely 
burn them and watch them dissipate and then ha and yeah. breathe through that in a way where you're like, I'm letting that go. I'm surrendering this so that I can yes. be a more open vessel to being the kind of person I want to be and to be able to, I mean, that stuff clogs us up mm -hmm. from really so being able to be in relationships. So particularly if it's about, about parenting and you want to have a deeper, better relationship with your child and move more in that direction, letting that stuff go allows you to really be able to tune in and communicate with your kids in ways that do that. It's holding us back. It's bad for you and it's bad for the relationship. Mm. So I think sometimes people like feel like that we have to hold on to our guilt to pay penance. And that's yeah. obviously not the message of the gospel either. No, it's to no. really, you know, allow that to, to fall from us. And it, even if it means doing some sort of ritual or symbol um, to help yourself let that go. It's interesting because we tend to think if we deny it first, if I can beat it down and deny it, that somehow life will be better, or then we try to fix it. And then if we can't do either of those, then we just feel stuck and depressive yeah. in it. When I think this uh, illustration of taking them, writing them down, burning them, and burning them in the concept of I want to see them be burnt as I turn to myself and have radical acceptance of me and my humanity, I want to accept me as a human in a fallen world and I don't get everything right, but oh, by the grace of God, I have hope for tomorrow, not based on my perfection. My past does not dictate my hope for the future in the sense of that I am human, I do make mistakes, but God does give me a hope in the future. And I do. I just think that's such a beautiful part of, of the gospel. And, and one well, thing I'll say just you. too is one of the big, big messages in the power of showing up based on the research is that history is not destiny. And I think that's an important mm. thing to hold on to. Just just right along with what you're saying. That Can you talk about that just a little bit longer, uh, a little bit yeah. more, unpack that just for a minute? Yeah, I think I mean it in two different ways. I mean, one is what I said in the beginning is that what your history has been in terms of how you experience detachment relationships. And by the way, that's one other way to be really kind to ourselves and let things go is to say your brain was wired from the collection of your experiences. And I think, you know, that's a big piece of the making sense process for ourselves. Right. So like I had secure attachment with my mom growing up, but I had a, what's called um, um, avoidant attachment with my dad. Um, and avoidant attachment is what I was talking about, where you kind of grew up in an emotional desert, you know, and, and you really, my dad was not interested in showing up for me emotionally. Um, and he was annoyed by any needs or emotions we had and those kinds of things. And what's so powerful about that is when I started learning the science and I started learning about this, um, I, I was able to look at, I, two things happened, Patrick. One was I went, Oh, and I, cause I started looking at my dad's history. I started looking at my grandparents and how they raised my dad and how my grandparents were raised and all the trauma that had happened in generations. And so I could get to my dad and say, first of all, it wasn't me. It wasn't that I wasn't lovable. It wasn't that I, I wasn't huggable or whatever. It was, that was about how his brain was wired. So there, that was freeing. And then the second part was that I could have compassion for him and say, oh, oh wow. as a little boy, he didn't get someone who showed up for him. And so his brain never yeah. wired to learn how to do that. And he wanted to be that, but didn't know how. I mean, the way he did it was with money or with joking around, but you know, that vulnerable yeah. stuff, he just didn't know how to do it. It was like a language he didn't speak. So I think what that's one thing I mean when I say history is not destiny is that I can look back and do a making sense process and say, okay, now what pieces of that of the way my dad parented me, do I not want to do with my kids? And what parts do I want to do intentionally? So when we reflect and shine the light of awareness and make sense of our story, we don't have to play out those same roles that just got wired in our brains that just take over. And then the other thing is that is, is what I said also, which is, I also mean that right now. So those of you who are listening right now, you can make a change right now. You can provide more yeah. four S's in your relation, in any relationship. Mm. And again, as those experiences begin to change, not only does it make it easier for you to have that be your more automatic, but it can start changing the relationship and moving towards the kind of relationship you want to be. So I mean that history is not destiny, both in your own history recently or, or yeah. throughout your child's you know, growing up years, but then also generationally what has come before us. 
That is so, so good. I've got one more question that exclusively I think you, <laughs> you and other child development therapists are going to be able to look at and, and help us with. And then we'll move into our uh, final words and, uh, and how people can find you. But uh, sometimes as parents, you experience uh, struggles, challenges, and you're like, I don't even know if I like you right now. And <laughs> then that turns into a weapon of shame as a parent. And you're like, I can't believe that I ever even thought or felt that. And I hear this from uh, moms who uh, have had those meltdown moments. Uh, what would you say to a mom who has had the experiences uh, of, gosh, I don't know that, you know, I like my kid right now. You mentioned earlier that at one time you threatened your three-year-old that you were going to take his body part out of his mouth. I, I love that his story, by out the of way. His mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me say this. Um, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of parenting consults. And I've led tons of groups, and I've spoken to thousands and thousands of people. And I don't know that I've yet met someone who didn't not like their child from time to time. <laughs> and sometimes that not like is really intense, and that word hatred is even appropriate, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that when we are in relationship with people in, in really meaningful ways, we're going to have a whole range of human emotions around those relationships. So let me just normalize that. Um, there are certainly times we don't like our children at all. Um, and I think in a way there's a there's a um, there's an intimacy about that. Right. Um, and, and really knowing that whether or not you like someone doesn't have anything to do with that, how much you love them or how committed you are to the relationship, right? I've been married for 27 years, and there are certainly times we don't like each other very much. <laughs> We're not gonna commit to show up for each other, or, or when we don't, to make the repair, right? It's, it's the work and labor of love. And it's super normal. I mean, I actually would be really worried about someone if they were like, every moment is a magical journey of love with my <laughs> child. I would be worried about you. So I think you should feel that. That is a healthy human emotion where you are in touch with how you really feel. And so just give yourself permission. I think also, and you know this very much as a pastor, our society is really bad at distracting ourselves from emotions. We like to numb yeah. out on our screens or with substances. Um, or with all kinds of things that are not so good for us, food, um, those kinds of things. The key is to learn to sit in the discomfort of our emotions and name them and mm. say, yep, that's part of the human experience. Yep, that's part of how humans are wired, how we were created. And I'm noticing that. And I know, and this is something we teach little kids that we talk about in the, in the uh, whole brain child is that feelings are like weather, they come and go, right? So you're gonna, you might, feel like you're going to wring your kid's neck. You know, like yesterday I had him, and this is a very minor moment, but I went into the pantry and I'm always needing more room in the pantry. I have teenage boys and they eat on like a newborn feeding schedule every two to three hours. So like resourcing food is a big deal for me. So I always need more room in the pantry. So I'm going in and trying to rearrange and I found three boxes that were empty in the pantry. And I'm like, I don't like you people. You know, what is wrong with <laughs> Like throw trash away. Why are there empty boxes in here, right? Um, and so, you know, and then I go, yep, that's what it's, that's what it's like when we live with people and we love them and we <laughs> sit in each other's stuff. But, but really just sitting in, in um, giving ourselves permission to sit in the discomfort of negative emotions. Um, yeah. When we don't let ourselves do that, we also can truncate our ability to sit in the emotions of positive emotions too. That is so, so good. Well, on this Mother's Day, what would be your heartfelt encouragement as you're speaking to moms and loving and celebrating them? Uh, again, just handing you the ball. What, what, what would you want to say to them? Two things. One is what your kids need most from you is you. Flawed mm. you, imperfect you, falling apart you making mistakes all the time you 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 and what you bring in relationship is what your child needs most for you and I would say that about any relationship as well and the second thing is that you matter too and and moms you know that self-care is important and self-care is not like you know um, buying something nice for yourself or those are fine too or taking a bath every once in a while with a candlelit self-care is an intentional 
act that happens daily if possible, whether it's five minutes of having peace to yourself or, you know, I love to watch junky TV after everybody goes to bed and surf the internet for 30 minutes, you know, whatever it is, going out for a walk without any stimulation, without any books or podcasts in my ears, um, making time intentionally to spend with my best friend, uh, making time intentionally to have breakfast burritos and with my husband, you know, these are things that are important. So what I say to you moms is that you matter too. And you always, yeah. you know, this is important the self care, but you're bad at it. I'm calling you on it because I know I'm bad at it too. <laughs> and I know the science behind why it's so mm. important, but I think, that you know when there are needs and there are a lot of needs especially this last you know 14 15 months the demands of of our lives have exceeded what's humanly capable a yes. lot of times and we're yes. grieving and all these losses so what i would say is that we matter too and so choosing ourselves and and really especially cultivating friendships is so key and and really even mm. if it's such a gift for your kid i actually just it's not been posted on social media yet but i just recorded a video a few days ago about how our friendships in adulthood are such gifts to our children first first of all it helps with longevity and health and all kinds of good outcomes for us but when our kids go into adulthood if their parents don't really have important deep friendships the burden of their parents needs cares issues that come up all fall on our children so when our children know that we have our own community separate from them they don't have to feel responsible for us so i think that and and those connections are so important if you're feeling isolated as a mom take time to cultivate friendships and relationships it's one of the most important things you can do for yourself and your kids what an amazing word. What, what an amazing conversation. You are, you are such a well of depth and breadth. It's, uh, I just, I can't say thank you enough. Thank I'm going to put Patrick. all of your information in the show notes at the, the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. And of course, we'll make it available to our church as well. Uh, but if people wanted to find you or your books, which I again want to highlight, embolden, that they are classics. They're books that every parent, when I hear parents who are kind of parenting by the hip uh, and kind of using old school ideas that their parents used, um, I'm like, gosh, there's such new science and information that is so transformational. And you may today feel like that you're managing your kids, but in about 20 years, you will be glad that you read these books because of the outcome. Uh, but uh, how would somebody find you? My website is tinabryson.com and you can find me all over social media. Right now, Instagram is the place I'm posting the most content and my handle there and on the other channels is Tina Payne Bryson. That's so awesome. Thank you again for being a part of our Mother's Day celebration this year. Well, thank you so much for having me and excuse the background noise. There's family, <laughs> right? It's COVID. We're all a lot of togetherness. So. Uh, you know, <laughs> there are actual people behind these walls and they're using microwaves and all kinds of things. So I don't know what they're up to. I'm afraid to find out. But thank you so much for having me, Patrick.